Welcome to the last in the Thames Luminaries virtual lecture series, a truly collaborative effort to celebrate our amazing luminaries and their landscapes drawn together by the River Thames. My name is Rachel Morrison and I'm from Marble Hill and I'll be the host for this lecture. So without further ado, I'd like to hand you over to our chair for this evening. She is a lecturer, a literary historian and a luminary herself. She's Professor Judith Hawley. Thank you, Rachel, again, for your, your kind introduction. And um, thank you for you to um, the audience. There, I think there are going to be about 700 or more people at this talk. And I know a lot of you have attended uh, many others. And it's been a real pleasure to know that uh, we've been able to give you something of the, of the delights of the locations we're talking about. Um, and it's a pleasure to know that there are so many supporters. I'm, I myself am one of the trustees of the, of the Pope's Grotto Preservation Trust. And we've been sort of delighted and overwhelmed with the way we've been able to connect with audiences, even though you can't actually visit us at the moment. So without further ado, I want to introduce our speaker for uh, tonight and the, the, the culmination of the entire series. Um, I want to introduce Rosie Files. Rosie is head gardener of Ham House and Garden. And over the last five years, she and the Ham House Garden team have received numerous accolades for their work, work on this 21 acre garden on the banks of the Thames. She's also worked in many private gardens and at the National Trust Garden, Polston Lacey, where I recently scrumpted some apple, I didn't tell her that. Um, she's now a regular garden writer, a Radio 4 contributor, and one of the National Trust garden champions, guiding other gardeners. Over to you, Rosie. Thank you very much. Um, I'm a little honoured and daunted uh, to be the last speaker of this Luminary series. I just want to uh, share my thanks for your support of our Thames side properties, engaging with us on the stories that we share. And I hope that this Friday evening, I can bring some beauty from our garden into your homes. The uh, contemporary, just as the 17th century garden is very, very much a team effort. And I'm aware I'm representing a large team this evening. Uh, many of whom are online, I think I'm pleased to say. Our garden team at Ham, our staff team, Christina, Jeanette and Vanessa, or the weeding, 17th century weeding women, as we might call ourselves, and more than 70 outdoor volunteers to thank you for your support and for watching this evening. So I want to share the ideas represented in Ham's garden and discuss how contemporary or relevant they are to us today. And I'll be looking at some of the origins of these ideas too. I'll suggest that perhaps our garden luminaries might be more 20th than 17th century. I'm not a historian. So uh, I, while I will talk about history, my focus is definitely on the garden and on how we garden. This aerial shot provides a simple summary of the garden's 24 acres. Uh, for those of you who don't uh, attend five days a week at the property, the River Thames is on this side. The garden has a lovely central access right through the house and takes you onto a terrace overlooking these grass areas called the Platts. You can just see a hint of the woodland garden, the wilderness. And then here is the walled garden, the kitchen garden, which in this picture you can see has barely begun to be recreated. This is what you might recognise from today. Um, I think it's a really lovely shot and, and just indicates how important the sky is in any garden, um, but also uh, shows the really key elements of 17th century gardens. So we have the repeated geometrical shapes, the uh, low sort of standard looking hedging, um, really repetitive use of plants, perhaps period plants, but also showing that kind of control over nature where the lavender is cut close into spheres. You'll also notice gravel paths, clear of weeds and some bare soil there. So in the 17th century, it was very, very common to show off your plants with 
almost like a framework of soil. So I think it's, it's really uh, interesting to consider what might be the most important moment in the garden's history. Um, Ham is part restoration, part recreation of a 17th century garden. And I think in the, the 400 years of Ham Garden's history, uh, you could be forgiven for suggesting that four years is a moment. And I would argue that the years 1975 to 79 are potentially the most important in the garden's history. That was when the National Trust received the funding to recreate the garden and the luminaries of that time, pioneering garden makers working for the National Trust, John Sayles, Graham Stewart Thomas and the day to day decision maker Paul Miles set about recreating this 17th century garden. And the scale of the work prioritised, was prioritised perhaps above the potential sensitivity of the conservation area. There'll be people wincing at the sides of this digger on such an important historical space. And John Sayles himself recalls, large scale garden restoration in the 1970s was a rare and ham was in the vanguard. There was little body of knowledge to draw upon and a paucity of experience and of techniques. The Garden History Society was less than a decade old. English heritage did not exist. That's from his book, Shades of Green. So this is the cherry garden that you saw previously. Uh, some very uh, detailed measuring going on here. Very young yew hedges going in. And this is the start of the hornbeam arbor tunnels so really starting from the ground up a little bit later about 1976 or early 77 you can see that the wilderness has completely been taken down we're left with grass plats a suspicious looking puddle there which i suspect we're still dealing with today and the ground completely flattened for for planting and here, right towards the end of the period, these two uh, guys in the photo are actually Paul Miles and Graham Stewart Thomas. And I, I see this photo and think what a challenge for the gardeners of that time to have visitors coming in and seeing such an embryonic garden. How do you sort of enable people to visualize uh, the, the thinking behind it and the, the garden that will appear from these tiny, tiny little plants? So what was the what, what was the inspiration for the 1970s recreation of Ham's garden? I think this picture is really important and it certainly informed some of the thinking. First of all, it shows the areas of ownership of the garden. The National Trust took over this specific area, didn't include some of the working spaces where there would have been greenhouses, etc. But it also shows really importantly the square areas, uh, the grass plats that we have today. So it gives a, a, a level of proof that the 17th century garden was there. And this is the plan that really inspired their thinking. It's the most significant in terms of what the uh, 17th 1970 historic garden designers chose to base their reimagining and their recreation of the garden on. They concluded that it was this pan, Sleezer and Wick, which is dated to about 1672, that represented the truest sense of the late 17th century garden at Ham. However, it's a plan without the full archaeological substantiation of being implemented there are key core areas of the garden where there's no evidence, in fact, of anything being laid out as the plan shows. There are other areas like the wilderness that we know some of the basic structure wasn't put in place in the 17th century, but we really don't know how much. In fact, it's those square core areas in the center of the garden, which we know most about. Caesar and Wick's perspective plan also has a few more questions there for us to answer. Uh, 
Uh, eagle-eyed amongst you will notice that the uh, pillars are not accurate to what we have today. Um, the fir trees, there's some evidence of fir trees at hand, but um, we're not really sure how they were planted or where they were planted. And then you can see steps are very, very different to what we have today and the house basement windows too. So these, these plans inspired the, seven, the 1970 restoration, but there was nothing there that was absolutely fixed. And certainly there was no detail of actual planting plans. So where does that leave us today? Well, this 2020 aerial shot taken by the National Trust unlocked Channel 4 programme sort of gives me a sense of uh, reassurance. The access from the house right down from the river, right through up to Ham Common is there for all to see and really lovely lines of historic avenues. And I look at this and think, actually, do you know, in, in spirit, this does really represent that 1672 Sleazer and Wick plan. There's overall a sense of grandeur uh, a sense of nature being controlled, but in a way that, that is refined. And this is an aerial view of the Cherry Garden uh, symmetry form and creating an exceptional view from the private rooms of the house. And it's interesting that this very, very popular piece of the garden that, that many people would think of as, as extremely historic, uh, was totally challenged in the 1980s when some archaeology was finally undertaken and that archaeological research suggested in fact no parterre garden was ever here. It was probably a place for standing out tender pots when the lady of the house uh, decided uh, she wanted the plants brought out and she wanted them in certain ways arranged in that garden. This is the aerial view of the wilderness. And I think it's an interesting one here. We have a real challenge now that these trees have grown to such an extent that the garden, um, the feel of the garden has changed. It's become a lot shadier and it makes the grass paths incredibly difficult to manage as, as perhaps you can see even from this shot. But I think the contemporary value of this space is is also reflected in his its historic usage the 17th century saw the emergence of the idea of walking in a natural environment as a cure for melancholy and i'm grateful for someone drawing my attention to robert burton's 17th century book the anatomy of melancholy and in this he recommends walking among orchards and artificial wildernesses and uh, it, it's really important to me that today our wilderness hosts silent space, a, a modern day approach to identifying spaces for silence, mindfulness and time alone in green spaces. And here, just referring quickly back to the Sleazer and Wick plan, that picture, this plan, there's a real sense of, of the historic in it. And without having a, a real level of detail, the spirit is represented and carried on. And this uh, was the Platts um, a couple of winters ago um, when we've been playing with different ideas of how to look after these large green spaces and reimagined them, inspired by the 17th century desire to impress at scale. Um, these large spaces were were indicators of, of work and labour force on site. Um, we've been looking at them in terms of managing them as grass meadows and planting them with spring bulbs. And then the, the kitchen garden. And this is where we really have the least detail about layout, but we do know that um, it was hugely productive and that Cook's records there indicate really bountiful production. And the last five years, as this image shows, it's, we've really aimed to bring the style of the formal garden and the kitchen garden together in spirit and really provide a haven for nature too. And I, I love this shot just because it, it feels so much like a patchwork. 
um, and was delighted that <laughs> Channel 4 used it. So today, um, on the ground, the, the kitchen garden is incredibly productive. Um, one of the areas shown right in the front here is our edible flower plot. And I think this is where it's really interesting how the 17th century ideas and contemporary ideas of gardening become kind of really compatible. In the 17th century, herbs and vegetables were grown for the entire plant and flowers were, were eaten as part of everyday meals. They weren't just there as garnish. And I think it's really interesting now that we're encouraging more plants to flower in the, in the kitchen garden to show how people were using them in cuisine in the 17th century, but also to provide nectar sources for pollinators. So the vegetable uh, crops that flower are, are very similar to those in the wild and they provide really, really um, important source of food readily visited by insects. And in 20, sorry, this goes actually shows the uh, the summer edible flower plot. And you can see here that what we're actually doing by having this path running through it is encouraging people to come in and try uh, different tastes and different um, textures of edible flowers. Um, and, and just as a word of warning, really much better to try a petal than to put the whole flower right in your mouth. In 2019, we took over um, and cultivated four more of these plots in the kitchen garden and planted an orchard. And we've got over 30 apple trees in here now. And this was really inspired by looking back at the inventory from 1653 and it shows a massive volume of fruit trees on the site, almost unimaginable how people looked after that many fruit trees then. But we know we know um, that there were at least 400 apples and 400 cherry trees on site being looked after and harvested. And the planting of this garden for us also signposts our gardening now and in the future that has climate change in mind. And we're inspired by history guided by the 1970s luminaries, but also making planting decisions that will thrive in the future. Um, we starting to understand predicted conditions and obviously just the act of even planting small trees is increasing our carbon sequestration as well. Thought I'd show you um, another Platts image. Um, this is from the 2018 Garden Reimagining. Um, very much connected to that 1970s image. I um, hope you appreciate the lower impact machinery in use. Um, here we took a proactive decision to link the design aesthetic of the house with temporary planting areas of the garden. And I've, I've been asked about taking that decision or, or, or getting agreement on that decision and how fundamental it is to the garden to be planting these areas of the plats and I I think it, it I, I gardens don't stop in time they they're constantly changing and constantly moving and, and people want that from us but I absolutely reassure people that visit as well that are concerned that we're using the guide of a 30 centimeter cultivation depth here nothing that we're doing is providing a um, something that can't be undone. Um, and we're just using the sort of resources and, and the space to, to create an atmosphere, to create the historic spirit. But um, the next time gardener can come along, mow it all off and it will be uh, green grass again. So in terms of our planting and how we're inspired by the 17th century, I think I have to admit that our color palette is perhaps more acceptable to 21st century taste. Um, we do try and plant in a specimen planting style, as I explained with the, with the soil sort of framing the plants. I think one of the most important things that has changed in the garden is that we are much more accepting of 
the need to choose plants that will thrive in the positions we're growing them in. Um, for those of you that are gardeners, Beth Chateau's right plant, right place, I, I feel is all the more relevant as we garden during a period of really dramatic and extreme weather events uh, and climate change. We also focus on plants that are good for nature. So, um, just as a brief snapshot, we now have 45 species of bee and wasp at HAP. Uh, and one of the reasons for this is choosing plants that provide a very long flowering period and provide easy access for insects. This is that same border space uh, later on in the year. Um, choice of cannas. Um, brings a stature to the planting, but also I think illustrates the stories of, of plant discoveries in the 17th century. Um, interesting sort of layers of stories that these plants were brought here as the product of trade routes. And I think whilst it evokes 17th century planting and certainly we're using period plants, I think for us, we also have to be realistic that we have to maintain the garden. We, we can't deal with quite as much bare soil, perhaps, as our predecessors, but we also have to provide sounds and scents and colours that the 21st century visitor can respond to, too. And the cherry garden is um, sort of presents an opportunity to us every six or seven years. Um, each of the 1200 plus lavender plants have to be replaced in order to keep them nice and tight and flowering well. And um, in 2018, we, we took the decision to look at the cultivars we were using in the cherry garden and try and establish whether we were using the right cultivars for the space now, for the, for the wet and for the heat that we were experiencing. And we decided to go with slightly more modern cultivars. Um, and what that has enabled us to do is to certainly still to mimic the 17th century species versions that were chosen in the 1970s, but to ensure a much longer flowering. And this means much more interest for our visitors who get to experience a, a lavender garden from June to September, but also longer food provision for insects and i think for gardeners that work in the garden including our volunteers the there's still bare ground but um it's not as hard to moan about weeding that bare ground when you see the number of wasps and bees nesting in it and they love the sandy alluvial soil we have at ham so there's a real connection in this garden between what we're choosing to plant, how we are gardening, and, and also the way that insects are coming in and, and enjoying the space too. So uh, what does the future hold? Well, the pandemic has created opportunities for heritage gardens, I think. Um, we've, we were able to interact and meet with people that perhaps have never visited us before. Um, we have gone from growing cut flowers for the house and for parties in the house in the 17th century to growing for the house and visitors up to the present day. And I think in the future, we'll be growing flowers like these with locals, for local people, for local residents and for our local wildlife. And it's been a really, really welcome opportunity during the pandemic to provide for our local food bank with cut flowers as well as fresh produce. And I'm really proud to say that we've produced over 500 posies for Rich Roo Food Bank. And um, that's one of the proudest things uh, we've achieved in the garden, I think. Uh, that's everything I wanted to share with you. Thank you very much. Uh, please do uh, Come back for some more Thames Luminaries lectures. I'm very proud to be the last one and do come and see us in Ham Garden.